Good morning. Welcome to Sunday School. This morning we are going to be continuing our study in Hosea, so I would invite you to grab your Bible and open it to the seventh chapter of Hosea, and we'll begin here in just a moment. First, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do come to you this morning just uh, thanking you, praising you, and looking to you for guidance today, for understanding. Teach us today. Help us to know the truth. Lord, I pray for our world. I pray for the, the things that we see happening, for this pandemic that's going on, continuing, uh, for, the, uh, for the fires and the problems that are going on out west. Uh, Lord, I pray for our election and for our nation, uh, for the, the issues that we see. Lord, I pray that you would lead us to be a country where you would be praised. Lord, I pray that your people would turn to you, would humble themselves, and that you would be able to heal our land. Lord, again, be with us this morning in everything that we do. Help us to learn and to know the truth that you would have us to know today. These things I pray in your precious name. Amen. All right. Last week, uh, we saw that Hosea, as he began his preaching, um, he, he began to call the people to come back to God. He said, it's not too late. Even though you've sinned, even though you deserve the punishment that God has, even though you deserve God's judgment, God still loves you. And so you can come back. It's not too late until the game's over. But then we also saw uh, what God was seeing. And you remember God, uh, God said something uh, along the lines of, in fact, it's chapter 6, verse 4. He says, what can I do with you, Ephraim? Like talking about little kids. What am I going to do with you? And um, what God saw was that um, he wants to show them mercy. He wants to show them forgiveness. He wants to bring them back to him. But the people aren't willing to to allow God to change them. Um, they are, they're not willing to allow God to be God. That's what it means to acknowledge God. They aren't willing to allow him to be God in their lives anyway because they want to live their own lives, their own way, without God or anyone else telling them what to do. A lot like our own world and our own people because people haven't changed. Uh, they're the same. Today, we're going to get basically into the heart of Hosea's preaching. Uh, in fact, for the next couple of three weeks, we're going to be looking at, uh, at this, the heart part of, of uh, Hosea's preaching. And it's very much a, a message of judgment against the nation. Um, uh, the sins of Israel are very much like the sins of our nation. And, uh, and we're going to see that. Um, and I'm going to want us to look at some, some big questions, several big questions that Hosea addresses and that are important for us to be able to understand God's judgment. You know, when we, when we read um, the, the prophets especially, uh, because they are uh, most of the time about sin and about judgment, now, we can come away with, we can get the feeling that God is harsh and hard-hearted. That he really doesn't care about people. And I've known people who felt that way about God. That he was judgmental. That he was hard-hearted. Um, and after all, uh, you know, if, if God really loved people, all this bad stuff that's going on wouldn't happen, would it? In fact, we sometimes hear people say something like that. If God is a God of love, then why does he allow such bad things to happen? Why does he allow all those fires out in California? Why does he allow um, all the bad things that occur in my life? 
<clears throat> God could stop it, couldn't he? <clears throat> and so the first big question that we need to look at today is, is God's will always what happens? In other words, does God, just because God wants something, does that mean that's what's going to occur? So as we look at this question, I want us to go to the seventh chapter, and let me read, uh, I'm going to read several verses. Um, I'm going to start with verse 1, and then I'm going to skip around. I'll tell you which verses I'm going to, so that you can follow along. And we're going to see what God wants and what happens. Okay? So verse 1 of chapter 7. Uh, it actually, it starts at the, the last part of chapter 6. God says, Whenever I would restore the fortunes of my people, whenever I would heal Israel, the sins of Ephraim are exposed and the crimes of Samaria revealed. They practice deceit. Thieves break into houses. Bandits rob in the street. But they do not realize that I remember all their evil deeds. Their sins engulf them. They are always before me. That's verses 1 and 2. Let's skip down to, to uh, verse 13 of the 7th chapter. Verse 13. Woe to them because they have strayed from me. Destruction to them because they have rebelled against me. I long to redeem them, but they speak lies against me. Go down to verse 15 of chapter 7. God says, I trained them and strengthened them, but they plot evil against me. Go to chapter 8, verse 12. God says, I wrote for them the many things of my law, but they regarded them as something alien. Go on to chapter 9 and look at verse 10 and verse 13. God says, When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your fathers, it was like seeing the early fruit on the fig tree. But when they came to, to Baal Peor, they consecrated themselves to the, to the shameful idol and became as vile as the thing they loved. And then verse 13. I've seen Ephraim like Tyre, planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim will bring out their children to the slayer. In these verses, we see a lot of what God wants. Um... And we need to understand something about God's will. You see, God, God's ultimate will is going to happen. And yet, we understand that in individual current circumstances, God sometimes puts limits on himself. You see, it is God's will that each and every person have a free choice to accept him and love him, which is what God wants, or to reject him, which is God, what God does not want. Yet God will limit himself so that he does not override a person's choice, whether it's to love him or to reject him. Now, in 2 Peter, the third chapter, he tells us that, that it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And yet we know that many, maybe even most, will never come to repentance and will never choose God. So we see that God's will, what God wants, does not always occur even though ultimately and in the end, what God wants will occur in the individual, everyday circumstances, God has limited himself so that we have free choices. 
Look again at these verses we read and see what happens. Chapter 7, 1 and 2. What does God want? Well, God wants to heal. But what do the people choose to do instead of allowing God to heal? Well, the people choose to practice deceit, to rob, to steal. God says their sins engulf them. Their sins are all around them. You know, often we think, okay, I did this, and I got away with it. Now that's behind me. I do something else. And, and, but God doesn't see it that way. My sin is all around me. My sin is always part of me. Going down to verses 13 and 15, there in chapter 7. What does God want? Well, in, in verse 13, God says, I long to redeem them. But what happens? Uh, what happens is they speak lies against me. And in verse 15, God says, I, I want to strengthen them. God says, I've trained and strengthened them. But what happens? They plot evil against me. Notice in both of these cases, they lie. But what do they lie about? They lie about God. Um, now God strengthens them. But what do they do? They use their strength to plot evil. And they plot that evil against God. Go on to chapter 8, verse 12. God talks about how he wrote many things for them in the law. What is the law for? Why did God give all those, those things in the Old Testament, all those laws and all those things for us to do? Because God wants to lead us in the way that we live. God wants to give us a standard that we can look at and that we can know when we're going in the right direction. So in, in chapter 8, verse 12, God wants to lead the people. But what do they do? It says they act like it's something alien. In other words, it's something totally foreign to them, something they're not going to do. They refuse to follow what God tells them to do. They refuse to obey. And in chapter 9, verses 10 and verse 13, what happens? You know, it's a beautiful picture here that, uh, that he points. He says, when I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. You know, God describes his joy, his excitement of, of being with his people, of finding them, like finding something good to eat, something beautiful in the desert where nothing around is good. That's what it was like. Uh, he talks about in, in chapter, er, in uh, verse 13, he says, he says they're like tire, they've been planted in a pleasant place. He says it's great to be around my people, but what do the people do? Well, he talks about when they came to, to Baal Peor, what did they do? They consecrated themselves to, sh to that shameful idol, and they became as veiled as the thing they loved. That's a reference to a time when they were in the wilderness and when the people uh, wanted to, to um, get the people away from God. They wanted to destroy the Israelites. So basically, they got the women to come to the men of Israel and to entice them and to, help, uh, to get them to come to their temple and to uh, worship their temple through sex. And God says, I found you in the desert and it was like finding grapes until what you did was you turned away from me and went to this other idol in order to get that pleasure. That's what it amounted to. In order to give yourself to... Uh, to the God of pleasure. And that's what they did. So we see in these verses, we see in what, um, what uh, uh, Hosea is saying here, is that what God wants to do for us, what God wants from us, is not 
what he gets all the time. Even in, in uh, chapter 9, verse 13, he says, he says, you will even bring your children to the slayer. Um, uh, when we, we think about our own society and the horrible sin that we have of abortion, where we bring our own children to be killed. Why? Because it's inconvenient to raise them. Because it's inconvenient to have them. Because it gets in the way and it interferes with what I want. So we see that God's will, that what God wants, is not what always happens. But I wonder, what do the people want? Surely, people want God on their side. I can't imagine that they don't want God and God's blessings, and they want to be on God's good side. They want God to do good things for them. Isn't that what people want today? But so let's, th that brings us to our second question, and it's what do people want from God? If we now see that, that God wants something from us, but he doesn't always get it, I wonder, what do people want from God? So in chapter 7, let's look at verse 7, and I'm, again, I'm going to go through and give you several verses, but if I go to, to verse 7 of chapter 7, it says, All of them are as hot as an oven. They devour their rulers. All their kings fall, and none of them calls on me. Going down to verse 10. Israel's arrogance testifies against him. But despite all this, he does not return to the Lord, his God, or search for him. Uh, go to verse 14. It says, They do not cry out to me from their hearts, but they wail upon their beds. They gather together for grain and new wine, but turn away from me. In verse 16, they do not turn to the Most High. They are like a faulty bow. Their leaders will fall by the sword because of their insolent words. For this they will be ridiculed in the land of Egypt. Going to verse eight, or chapter 8, rather, verses 13 and 14. Verse 13 of chapter 8. They offer sacrifices given to me, and they eat the meat. But the Lord is not pleased with them. Now he will remember their wickedness and punish their sins. They will return to Egypt. And verse 14. Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces. Judah has fortified many towns, but I will send fire upon their cities that will consume their fortresses. Notice what the people want. In, uh, chap in verse, chapter 7, verse 7, you know, uh, it talks about how they are as hot as an oven. That's a reference to their emotions. They are basically being led by their feelings. They are looking for this pleasure, God, that they have. And all of their kings fall. Bad things happen. Things get out of hand, and yet they don't call on God. Um, in in, uh, in uh, verse 10 there, it says Israel, Israel's arrogance testifies against him. But despite this, you know, he doesn't return to God. He doesn't search for God. Um, when I look at, um, you know, add verse 16 to that, that, they do not turn to the Most High, they're like a faulty bow. Their leaders will fail, will fall by the sword because of their insolent words. Boy, if, if we need any example of arrogance and insolence, 
All we have to do is think about last Tuesday night and the debate that we saw. Two men whose arrogance testifies against them, whose insolence, whose insulting, whose totally, I don't even know what words to use here, but whose, whose language um, was so disrespectful to each other and because of that to us. You know, because of their insolent words, they will be ridiculed. And it wasn't just one, it was both of them. I guarantee you God is not pleased with that. And what we see is that they really don't want to look for God. When I go over to chapter 8, we looked at those couple of verses in chapter 8. It says, they offer sacrifices to me, but the Lord's not pleased with them. You see, what do the people want from God? Well, basically what they want is they want God to bless them as long as they don't have to be responsible for anything that they do. As long as God will just kind of leave them alone. What do people want from God today? Same thing. They want God's blessings, but not the responsibility of following God. They want God to leave them alone and let them do their own thing. Not to be held accountable. You know, that's a phrase that, that we hear quite often today is people being held accountable for their actions. But people don't want to be held accountable for their actions. They want to hold others accountable. Notice the, another thing that I, that I noticed in this. Um, let's see, it's verse um, 14 in chapter 7. It says, They do not cry out to me from their hearts. The, the hearts of the people don't, reach out to God. They should. They don't do that, but what do they do? Um, they don't turn, uh, but they wail upon their beds. What that's saying basically is they complain about everything. People today want something to blame, someone to blame for their own problems. They want to complain about their own troubles, yet they don't call out from their heart to God. They don't go looking for God because they know if they go to God, they're going to be told what they need to do to fix it. They're going to, they know that it's going to be partly their fault, and they don't want it to be their fault, not at all. So they don't turn to God. Well, that's two big questions that we've looked at this morning. We're going to stop there for this morning. We're going to continue looking at some big questions in in Hosea's um, uh, message uh, the next week. And um, uh, so we will continue this kind of discussion. I would invite you to read uh, the rest of the, the book of Hosea as we go through this. Let's see, it goes all the way to chapter 12, chapter 13. If you read through chapter 12, chapter 13 is going to be kind of a standalone, 13 and 14. It goes to 14, doesn't it? Let's see. Chapter 14 is the one we're going to stand pretty much on its own. Uh, but the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at some more of the big questions that Hosea brings up. Uh, let's close in the word of prayer. Lord, I do thank you this morning that the things that Hosea is speaking about sounds like he's talking to our own nation, to our own people. I thank you that, uh, that it's clear that we need to change. But Lord, I pray that as Hosea speaks, as you speak to us through him, that we will turn back to you. Lord, we need to humble ourselves. We need to accept our own responsibility 
We need to cry out to you from our hearts. We need to allow you to be God in our lives. Lord, tell us what to do. Lord, I pray that we will have the wisdom and the strength to obey as well as possible. Be with us this week in all that we say and do. These things I pray in your name. Amen.